Hi there, I'm Michael Hill with Canine Chronicle TV, and I'm very excited to be joining my dear friend, Mr. Ray Cataldi of Rojan Great Danes today. First of all, Ray, congratulations on being AKC Working Group Breeder of the Year. It's quite an accomplishment. Thank you, sir. Thanks. <laughs> Let's, um, I really want to talk about your life in dogs. I think that's something that's important to show how, because I know how you started very young um, and you've now been in the breed and purebred dogs for over 50 years um, and have accomplished a lot. <laughs> and um, I, I think it's impossible for anyone at 17 to see where you might go in a life with dogs like this. And as you know, because you're the one who helped get me started in dogs, I was also 17. <laughs> and now here we are a decade later. Oh my God. <laughs> so let's start with, um, you know, in those early days, what was your vision for where you were gonna go with Great Danes and how did that start? Well, I bought my first Great Dane in 1967 when I was 23 and I had no vision whatsoever. <laughs> um, I, it was, I, it was, I bought an, an adult 13 month old brindle bitch and um, a pet type bitch actually. It was a good quality bitch from a, the top sire in, started by the top dog sire and Great Danes at the time, but yeah. it was really not a show dog. Um, and I just stumbled along and I had bad guidance and uh, had no concept or idea. I had never been to a dog show. Hmm. How did you end up at a first dog show? The people that I got here from suggested that I go to Lakeshore Great Dane Club, which was a really big event in Chicago area. And at that point, it was a really big event. Um, and I went there, and I actually showed two dogs. I showed a blue bitch. It was my first show, and her. And I got so nervous after the blue bitch that I couldn't go back in with the brand. <laughs> so um, sometime later, I just went along for about three years with totally um, unhappy with the results I got and and, and you tried different colors and dogs. Every, no, 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 nothing. No concept, no, no results. It was just a, a stumbling along. And then I accidentally met, three years later, I accidentally met three really knowledgeable Great Dane people. Mm -hmm. I went to someone else's house to breed to their dog. And when I got there, they had guests. And the guests were Gloria Keppen. Gene Fowler and Hazel Gregory of Von Riesenhof Kennels. Well, first of all, I didn't <laughs> want to get my dog out of the car. <laughs> but after I lived through that, uh, I realized that um, we talked and we, I, I, th there was a whole nother path. Yeah. And it changed everything for me. I, after I got that knowledge and I left, I did breed to the dog. But when I left, I had this no, no, head full of new knowledge and new. Uh, you direction. had a concept. Yes. Right. I also became lifelong friends with those three people. Hmm. And um, I took my same bitch, my brindle bitch, and I bred her to a young dog that the one lady, Jean Fowler, had bought from Van Riesenhof Kennels. Mm -hmm. Uh, he was only about 13 months old, but he was a really good dog. And I went and I bred her to that dog. Mm -hmm. He was a bloodline dog. I didn't know that at the time. But not, and that's, but what, I, that's what Hazel had done, right? Complete different deal, yeah. And um, so when my first champion was born as a result of that. Yeah. Champion Roshan's the hustler. I finished him myself in almost no time from bred by and uh, he became uh, a, a serious dog. Right. And, um, and he became a special as well, right? Yes, and I had, to, I had to make a deal with someone to do it because I couldn't afford anything. Right. But I realized that he was a dog that merited it. And H Hazel Gregory sat with me in an airport. I sort of remember it as if it was yesterday. And she took me by the hands and took me face to face. And she said, 
I have to explain something to you. You better make sure you make really good choices here because this dog that you have could change your life. It sounds corny now. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I'm looking back at it like, a, oh, okay. I mean, I, I didn't really understand it. Right. And actually it did. Yeah. I had to give the dog up because I had a, people were trying to buy him from me. Mm -hmm. And I, I uh, got approached by the Maury's who were high level show dog, Great Dane people. Mm -hmm. Not easy. And uh, they made me a deal that they would pay for the dog if I would send him out of the area. Because they had a dog that wanted to become good next year. And it would yeah. be a problem for them if I sold that dog to someone else. Right. So I, I, it was really hard to do. Your first champion and your first dog and you loved your dog. And, but I knew I had to do it and I did it. And he went, they sent him to California and with the Rodwells, who were really successful Great Dane handlers. And that uh, was Doug Rodwell at the beginning. They got a divorce, and then they finished him with Sylvia Radwell. Mm -hmm. He became number two in the nation for 1972, and then I got him back. That was the deal. They would show him there, and then when he was done, he would come back to me. Mm -hmm. So we did all that. He came back, and um, in the meantime, I had been breeding a little bit more and right. really, really involved with dogs from – the hustler's sire, the boss. Yeah. So uh, we finished, uh, and Steve Cochran was with me at the time, and we finished a lot of uh, the dogs from the boss. So uh, we never really bred to the hustler ourselves because yeah. I didn't have what I had now, uh, a vast number of top bitches to breed to any dog. And, uh, and then I started to do line breedings, and I started to learn more and more, and and, and uh, people started to notice the blood, the style, and um, really what was happening, even though I didn't know, exactly know it or have a vision for it, is that I was at the beginnings of creating a bloodline. That's what yeah. Hazel Gregory did. That, and I knew the blood. I was at this cusp of the end of the real bloodline breeders in our breed. Right. Was there were dogs there were Ginro kennels, uh, Von Riesenhoff, Mount Dania, Mary Dane. Those were powerful kennels that developed this breed in the US in that time. Yeah. And I so I was at like the end of them, but I interacted with them some. I got to sit there when we'd go to their houses. I remember being at Rose Roberts now. It wasn't like today. I didn't speak. <laughs> <laughs> no, there was no speak. I just sat there. And, and learned. Say, oh, oh, okay. But I did learn, and some of it uh, synthesized. And yeah. So you begin to realize that's sort of how I got into that, uh, to the bloodline idea. In the meantime, Gloria Keppen is responsible for teaching me Great Danes structure mm -hmm. and type. Yeah. I mean, that's the whole difference in the world. If I can say anything to anyone, when I look at dogs, all breeds, the biggest difference in the common denominator is those that really know and those that don't. And if you can get to really know your dogs, whatever your breed is, structure and type, especially type, it'll set you, it'll carry you for the rest of the, everything. It's the difference between excellent individuals and just dogs. That's right. The details, what makes them that breed. And if you, if you identify with that and if it touches you, you can learn to create, you have to create them. And that's what you did based on that initial kind of impact right. that the hustler gave you. And then you created that generation after generation. So what I really did, I learned process from Hazel and those other bloodline breeders, process. Mm -hmm. But I really learned dogs from the one person, Gloria Kappen. Mm. And um, 
more than anything. I mean, there, there are other things too, but, and then that gives you a start way different than what I had before I met them. Oh yeah. Yeah. So, and I went step by step, inch by inch. And I created in the beginning, when I look back now, sometimes I say to myself, how could it be that I might've had some of my best dogs when I knew the least? Yeah. But the fact was, it was the process that was doing that. Mm. And, um, and those genes that were there already from those dogs before you. Right. And it's combinations. Breeding is about pairing and combinations. Hmm. Dogs Explain are that about, more. What was that? Explain that more. I, I can look in my kennel one time and I said, boy, I have a great dog in my kennel. The problem is it's in two dogs. So what you have to do is you have to keep sorting. You keep constant. When you do a bloodline, you keep sorting and sorting and sorting. You're gathering virtues that you want, and you're discarding negatives. Yeah. And that's how it goes on. And as I, as I went on, and even now, I, I breed the bloodline. The individuals fall out of the bloodline. And I that's how you get those percentages, right? That's right. That's right. I never had a lot of dogs like some people and some kennels are, but I had extremely high percentages. There's yeah. bitches had 10 and 12 champions or, and, and they all had four. Yeah. And it's just how it was. And also for those who don't know, you have three runs in your garage and your dogs live in your house and that's, that's how it always is. <laughs> and I never had more than four dogs. Yeah. I had huge percentages and I guarded the bloodline and I still do. You have yeah. to protect the bloodline and you have to protect the future. People now, they breed to get a dog to take to the dog show often. Mm -hmm. I have to protect the future breedings as I breed. I can't get myself off into a corner or off into to a, a so, so a blood, bloodline breeding is so different than uh, uh, the way most- Outcrossing for a winner. Yeah. I was not ever affected by the dog show nearly as greatly as so many people are. Um, there's no right and wrong in all of this, by the way. My yeah. way is the only way or the best way or anything. It works for me. Right. And, um, but anyway, so bloodline dogs, and when you breed to a bloodline dog, you're really getting way more bang for the buck. Because... What you get when you breed to a bloodline dog is completely different. You know, it, it, you're getting the past, the present, and the future. Mm -hmm. And when you, when, and I want to say one other thing. It, some of it, some of it is luck that I met those people. It isn't that, you know, it's very hard in today's world for the people to get this information, to learn it, to learn process. Yeah. That. I mean, uh, Especially in breeding. That mentorship. Right. Yeah, that, that's the only way. But anyway, get me back on track, will you? <laughs> Let's talk about the priorities of a Great Dane breed. I think that's something that's important for people who don't know the breed to understand what makes, what, what you value that's going to be different than other breeds because that's not always going to, you know, the same priorities aren't going to be the same in each breed, right? For sure. You also have to find the place where you want your dogs to be at the dog show. There's dogs that do well in the group and there's dogs that do well in the breeds. And when you have a breed like Great Danes and there's other breeds like this that have so much activity and so much notoriety within the breed. Right. First of all, when you're at the show, you have to use 90% of your dog up to win the breed. Forget yeah. about the group. Right. <laughs> and, uh, um, so the same virtues aren't really required to be a group and best in show winning dog as they are a breed winning dog in some breeds. Right. In Great Danes, type is paramount. And in Great Danes, the type begins at the head. 
It does not stop there. I want it all. I don't just want good heads. That's not good enough. I want it all. But if it doesn't have a good head, what it has past that is not really relevant for me. Right. It's supposed to be an artistic breed, right? That's right. And it has to have extreme beauty. Of Great Dane is what its function is, is his appearance. It's a great line. That whole story about the boar and all that, I don't even believe that, that that's true, but who knows? I wasn't there. Believe it, <laughs> not, believe it or not. But um, I think that was a mixed breed dog. And it doesn't even matter if they were boar hunters because it's not in our standard. The word is not in our standard. Yeah. But and the we, words Apollo of dogs and beauty. The dog breed today is an estate dog. It's a guard. It's a it's a guard dog, but it's not a sentry dog. It's not a alarm dog. It doesn't bark. It doesn't attack. It doesn't do any of that stuff. It goes to the gate and it stands there and it's saying to you, "Until my master comes, you'll remain on the other side of the fence." Yeah, it's impressive it's by that, appearance. That's right. So anyway, um, as I went on, I did you know, better and better. I struggled along, but I- You professionally got the, handled for people. You had yeah, number I one dogs. Never really wanted to be a handler. I, this is tricky stuff for me to say here. Yeah. I don't know, and I used to, I, and I did it, and I won a lot, believe me. Sure, like, but your passion was the breeding and the handling was how you got. Yes, I had to, I had, I came to a time in, when, when Steve's job transferred him to Texas, I needed, more money. Yeah. And uh, I never exploited the dogs. I exploited myself a little, but never the dogs. And um, I handled for t more than 20 years as a professional handler. All colors, all, only Great Danes. Mm -hmm. And anyone's breeding. And, and I did a really lot of winning. Yeah. So, um, but I never, I used to look at other handlers, especially in other breeds when I was in the group. And ones that I knew that were my friends, those handlers had the kill in them. Yeah. I never had that. Right. And I used to wonder why I was, uh, why, I, I mean, if I didn't win, I won so much that if I didn't win today, I'd win tomorrow. What was the big deal? <laughs> you know, I didn't, uh, I didn't die over it. Now, I don't and you also, to, you also took on dogs, though, that you believed in, too, right? For specials, especially. Mm-hmm. I never that did makes a, a difference in the in the in the most of my career especially, and I went a long time never being less than number four. Yeah, twenty years with different dogs, not all Rojans either, and I showed more Harlequins than and probably to the high level than any other handler. Yeah, and um, and and I don't mean winning isn't important. It has. It's really important. It, you definitely feel better after you win than after you don't win. There's no, I'm not putting it down, but it didn't, right. I did not have the kill in me. Right. I had more for producing the dog. Even if, I'd rather have a dog that never sired a champion than a, cha than a, num than a best in show winner. I, I said it backwards. I'd rather have a dog that sired, that impacted the breed Right. That was never a champion than a best in show winner that never signed a champion. Which has and happened. That, that's just how I am. I'm not yeah. saying one is better than the other. It takes all the parts of this whole deal for what we do. It Everyone can't be the same. Breeders, oh, it takes owners, breeders, handlers, and judges. It takes all the parts that are important. Mm. So one isn't more important than the other. But for me, breeding is what... I ident always identified as a breeder. I love that. I, I, in the in the handling, you did show a couple of your own breeding that were pretty impactful, right? Rojan's rumor has it was a national specialty winner, number one, multiple breast and show winner, um, and mystified me number two in the breed. She was multiple best and show winner as well. Were those dogs more meaningful to show because they were from your breeding? They are in some ways. Yeah. But I also showed other dogs. Uh, when I showed a special, it's almost like a marriage. You really have to, you, you have to 
really bond with it. And then you have to really, I really had faith in almost all the specials that I ever showed. I could not do that kind of effort for a dog I didn't believe in. That's just how, uh, you know, and I had that luxury. So, and I got the best clients. They were somehow attracted to me. I mean, I had the best clients in, in Great Danes, I'm telling you. Well, let's talk about the people. I think that's an important thing to focus on, those relationships that you had. Because like you said, it's a marriage to the dog, but also the owners that you're traveling with. It's not good to have turmoil going on within the organization when you're especially a a top-winning dog. I had great clients, uh, all in different ways. Um, the first dog that I specialed when I first decided to be, I needed, I wanted to be a, do handling. I figured that a dog became in sight. That's what I'll say. Mm-hmm. And I needed something different than a Rojan. I had a strip break and make some distance between me and Rojan. Yeah. To take me seriously. And I showed uh, champion BMW Bully owned by Marianne Zanettos and Laura Kalanis. And um, it was completely different, and he did really well. And uh, I, he was a top-winning uh, Harlequin and Best in Show winner. Yeah, and uh, so it put some distance between me. And then after a few dogs, I started to move the Rojans back in. <laughs> <laughs> I told the dog people, so the uh, I did um, rumor, of course. Yeah. And I did a, a lot, a lot of, oh, I did the other Harlequin Trailblazer for the Rundles. Mm-hmm. I did, I had the very best clients. And there were and a so lot. many of those are still in your life and, and friends of yours, right? Some, some, a lot of them are dead. <laughs> uh, and they all could, almost, they all could afford it. There was, it was very different in our breed then. Mm-hmm. Nowadays, the breed is not uh, in the same situation. Doesn't yeah. attract same group. That doesn't mean the people aren't good, but uh, uh, it's, there was a disposable uh, income there to make it possible for you to be focused on one dog. Yes, and um, and also, I was I, I did well with those people. They did well with me, and I did well with them. Hmm. And so it, it worked well. That that's what it was. Some of them were difficult, and then I have to get them. You know, you have to. But but anyway, I did I did real well with that. But I never, I had to do it, and I did it well. And I, I'm not saying I didn't like a lot of it, but yeah. wasn't my real thing, right? Um, I never have any of that on my on my Facebook page or on my website or anything. I have no right. picture, no. I have no trophies around the house. I'm just not stuck on the dog show. I, yeah, I, your I, house is all the art of your own dogs that you've bred. Yeah. And, and and then, of course, what happens when you breed dogs for a long time, like I did, and you have a really there's a there's two there's a pos, there's a double edged sword to breeding a bloodline. I have such a strong identity by the appearance of the dog itself. Yeah. I mean, they could take Roshans out anywhere in the world, probably if their wall mm-hmm. one walks in the ring, they would get. When I see a dog like like um, now, oh, I was going to say so, but I don't want to. But but uh, when you see a specific look, it's registrable. Yeah. Well, it can only be one dog or one yeah. bloodline. So right. so, and we don't have that in in my breed much anymore. And um, so I'm 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 flying a little a little you know. Yeah no no, but I think it's a, it, what you're kind of pointing out is that that breeding family of dogs has created a legacy that's notable. It's a double breed anywhere. Double doesn't like them best. Yeah. They don't have, and the, here's the facts. Some things I say are fact and some are opinion. That's how yeah. my brain works. The facts are that um, all dogs don't have to look like my dogs to be good dogs. Sure. Mine are not the only good dogs. My way is not the only good way. Whether it's in showing, handling, breeding, or, or anything. There's many ways to become known or successful or get whatever it is that you're after 
while you're participating in show dogs. There's yes. more than one ways to get there. So everyone has to find how it works best for them. You forge your own path. Yes. And you didn't have any way of knowing this is where you would be when you were 23, but now you're looking back on it now. Are you happy with how it went? Yes. I also did have, however, policies mm -hmm. that I really stuck by. You know my one. This is the first one of all. Never yeah. settle. Never settle. Yeah. So many people that bred dogs that I, I learned, as much as I learned from those good breeders, and I learned a lot, I also noticed how not to be. So that's equal learning. I'll tell you another thing. I all, you learn, there are, there are losses that you had in the ring that are still vivid in your mind today, even over wins. You learn from winning and you learn from losing. You, so there's so, you, you have to learn from all the experiences that you have. They're all part of it. Yeah. Anyway. And I think another policy that's worth talking about is about the players being more important than the game. Absolutely. To me, this is for me now. Everything I say, I don't tell people what to do. I don't tell them how to be. I tell them what I would do. For me, dog shows are about people. The, dog, the competition is about dogs. So let's not, you know, as soon as I say that, I'll, they all say, oh, yeah, yeah, you know, it's this and that about political and all that. That's not it. The fact is anyone can make it that comes into dogs that does a really good job and makes good decisions. There are no limits. You can win. You can make it all the way to best and show at the garden or whatever else your goal is. You can. That doesn't mean you will, but it's but you can't make it a fantasy. Right. You know, when you're a little boy and someone says to you, what do you want to be when you grow up? And they say, I want to be a cowboy or I want to be an astronaut or I want to be a movie star. I want to, those are fantasies. That's not bad. Everyone has those. And, uh, uh, but you can't make it a fantasy. You have to have a step-by-step -step process of moving forward. A vision. That's right. And I'm forward thinking, even on my breeding program, on everything. I'm forward yeah. thinking. Uh, and you have to go inch by inch, step by step. You have to keep gaining. You have yeah. to be bringing in, bringing in virtuous things and discarding negatives. Not only in your dog's bloodline and in your breeding and in your genes, but in your also in your behavior and in your friends and your what you learn and and everything about it. And the people are more important than the game. That's actually a line from the play chess. Yeah. But uh, it's a fact. And I don't like to hurt people's feelings. Uh, you have to be careful. I'm rambling now, but... Yeah, you, but it's important you, to maintain that perspective that the end-all be-all is not the win but, or the goal. It's not giving false praise. Right. I do not, you know this, I do not <laughs> I do. give false <laughs> I do not a favor to someone. It I doesn't do any good. I try not to hurt their feelings but I don't give false praise. Because mm -hmm. after I say their dog looks nice and when it wins one point somewhere, they'll spend $10,000 trying to get it finished and it never will. Yeah. So you gotta be careful about that. But I always do encourage, I, I encourage people and I challenge them. What I do is I try to challenge people into doing better work. Yeah. And, um, and it benefits me. And I learn back from them, you know, I love, you know, you, you don't know how many people I love. Through dog. Well, maybe you do. Yeah. But, <laughs> but um, the, the relationship. They give you something just as much meeting, as you give them. The minds, and they're all different kinds of people. Hmm. You know, dog shows are really different than a lot of things. There's very few competitions where, first of all, where men and women go on the field t together, where amateurs yeah. and professionals go on the field. In dogs, the young and old, in dogs, the fact is whoever has the best dogs gets noticed. That's just the way it is. Not every single time, but for the most part. Yeah. And if you really do a great job, 
you can get respect. And respect is even more important than winning. And, and you, but you can also win. There's no limits in dogs. I really think that. And um, including finances. The fact is, I don't know about today so much, but before, I used to say to the people, they'd say, oh, well, though, that dog wins because they have so much money and this and that. And I used to say, you know what? You get the dog, I'll get the money. It's harder to get the dog than the money. Now, and it does take a lot of money yeah. to do things at high levels. That's up to you. You go as far as you can, but it doesn't right. take that much to be excellent. So, anyway. let's wrap up with what would you tell somebody in your position in their twenties or late teens, like you did with me, on how to get started and set their path in the sport of dogs? You, you simply have to make good decisions. Good decisions. And you have to do the. You have to put yourself out there. One of my biggest pet peeves is I. I there's a lot of these in dogs too. There's a lot of people that have a lot of to say and a lot of ideas and want to tell everyone how to be. But they have no body of work. They never did anything, and that's all nice. They're entitled to their opinion, but. Right. Um, but is the data there to back it up? Take it easy here. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and, and there's also a lot of people. That, are, that have a lot of background that really don't do that well. Like I know judges that they're, each thing is a separate entity too. And you have to find your place where you, someone might succeed best as an owner, as someone might succeed best as a breeder or as a handler or as a judge. So it doesn't work a hundred percent, but we have a lot of people and dogs that decide things. You have to learn this stuff. When you're starting, you have to learn. You can't just, you can't go to the hospital and hang out and be a candy striper and then decide you'll do a surgeon one day after five years. You've got to learn these things. It's a process. You can't decide them. And, uh, and you've got to get the very best that you can when you start. You have to get the very, if you're going to be a breeder, you have to get the very best bitch that you possibly can afford. And I'm not talking about best by win by wins. I'm talking about the background, and you have to you, the foundation. Each thing is separate. Why give yourself a test that's impossible to pass? Right. You have to re recreate the wheel every time you do anything. Right. What I did is I took a, a blood. I bred to a bloodline dog, and I and I built on that. So you have to keep building at it. You know, the people I meet today, like you and like I, others I can name, they're going to be better than me. But it's because of the work to, that you did. They have to, do, they have to, get, they have to be better. They have right. to be better than all the ones that are out there now. There's some that can. And most of the people that I notice when they're beginning, not, not right in the beginning, but most of them, when I meet them, I can remove barriers. I can make it go a little faster for them. I didn't, I had some of that, but I didn't really have that. But I did have Gloria Kepin. And, uh, but most of those people are going to make it with me. Or most of the people are going to make it with me or without me. Those are the people I like to work with. They don't need me to make it. I but can't make it. they can both work together, why not? But I Move in long form, especially in the beginning. I can get them on good footing. Right. And uh, it's a great thing, and dogs can give you a great life. It's given me a great life. Mm. It's gotten me farther and better friends and stronger relationships and everything about it. it I, I, uh, you, and it's just amazing. But you have to take it for yourself. You know, there's people like that I have that are good friends. That um, Dana Klein, he was young too, seventeen. Like, and you know, I just had this talk with him once. You know what he did? He the reason he's so good. He went out and he did it, and he took it for himself, and now he owns it. Yeah, and that's what you have to do. You can hang around with people. You can. You got to notice a lot of things. You have to notice the bad and the good. 
and you have to stay clean. Let's not forget that one. And you have to, which is not always easy. And you have to, um, you have to manage yourself well and make good choices. But you've got to put yourself out there. So mm -hmm. when you fall down, you, you know, you. Sometimes the steaks, sometimes the potatoes, right? <laughs> My side said that to me. Never forget it. Yeah, I can see her sitting there saying it to me. She said, hey, Ray, how'd you do today? I said, oh, I didn't. And she said, sometimes the steaks, sometimes the potatoes. It's that simple. <laughs> that, that sounds silly, funny, but it's that simple. Yeah. That simple. There's a lot of good people, so many smart dog people. Oh, there are. And you watch the Braves and you watch. But you got to remember one thing you asked me in the beginning now. The Great Dane in the breed, the way I breed them, doesn't have the exact set of circumstances that you would breed a dog to win the group and best in show. Right. It might not show like a Doberman. Yes, but that isn't, that isn't actually what we want in the Great Dane. Correct. We don't want it to turn to the side when we run back. We wanted to look at the judge in the face and look at his head and look at the face and the neck that presents the head to him. Right. We want it all. But, uh, so each breed is different. Right. Well, I don't want my dog just to stand there and stare at a piece of food. Right. I want it to even show the head this way and that way occasionally. I want it to be part of the the, the environment of the room. Mm -hmm. And, um, and, and it's, and it's, it's, it's amazing to me. You can do anything through breeding. I believe that now you can affect everything through breeding. Health, temperament, you know, eye, everything, foot, everything. <laughs> personality, even yeah. trade, even Habit. eating. It's, all things you can't i'm not it's not easy but as you go on and there's one other thing you have to remember as a breeder i'm speaking there's only one thing that's immortal in this whole deal and that's the genes the dogs aren't immortal and the people aren't immortal but the genes are in the house in the container of the mother of the bitches of these breeds that's where you right. hold them together the bitch line. And, and they are forever hmm. anyway well, I just want to thank you so much for sharing with us, Ray. It's really clear that you've made a life based on a passion for dogs, not just about competition or finances, but it's really something that I, has struck you. I do. And how fortunate to have a life based on that. Right. And it's about living art. I have to say that, too. I think that's beautiful. Well, Good. Thank so. <laughs> well thank you so much and congratulations on on your award this year that's um, most Very, deserving i'm really grateful for that bye for, for everyone at the canine chronicle thank you so much for your time okay michael good job <laughs>